Hi, welcome to another episode of Pitch. I'm Leah. And I'm Angel. And today we have a new friend of ours, Ed Horowitz, screenwriter, playwright, script consultant, professor. What don't you do? Laundry. <laughs> How appropriate. <laughs> Wish I could say that. No, I do, I do laundry. Um, there are lots of things I don't do. Um, welcome, brother. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be here with the two of you here in Pitch Central. Yeah, Pitch Central Hollywood, the heart of Hollywood. That's what we say here. Hollywood. Um, what are some of your credits for people who might not recognize your name? I don't expect anybody to recognize my name. I um, I wrote a couple of action movies back in the day starring Steven Seagal, one with Steven Seagal and Michael Caine Nate, called On Deadly Ground. I wrote another one called uh, Exit Wounds with Steven Seagal and DMX. I wrote uh, a movie called Canine P.I. with Jim Belushi. Nice. I wrote an independent film called Shark in the Bottle. I used to be the freelance writer for the original The Femme Nikita. Um, I've written about 60 produced short plays through this theater program that I did for about 10 years. And um, I'm an ASCAP songwriter. That's amazing. Wow, what a wide breadth of things. That's cool, man. Yes, I sort of never really planned a career. I sort of just wrote and did whatever seemed interesting at the moment. And sometimes that worked out and sometimes it did not. So this actually is a really cool segue into something I've been thinking about is what you do just as a human being finding a way to make that a career so were you just writing as like teen as like a young adult and then you were told hey you know your writing's pretty good you should like do a thing and then now your career so many years later is comprised of all these things you've written <laughs> that would have made my life a lot easier <laughs> um uh you know people in, when i teach students often ask me how do you plan your career in hollywood and somebody smarter than I once said, you cannot plan a career in Hollywood. If you ha are fortunate enough to have a career, you can look back and figure out how you got there. Mm -hmm. But Hollywood is not a, an ecosystem where there's a path that you can follow. Um, I was in high school and I wanted to be a rock and roll singer like Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull, except I cannot carry a tune across a room in a bucket, but that didn't seem to stop my dreams. Um, and evidently my sister says I wrote song lyrics and show them to her. I have no recollection of this, but I did play drums in a band. Then I went to college and had no clue what I was going to do. And I had four roommates, all of whom were writing short fiction. And I thought, oh, if they can do it, I can do it. So I started taking fiction classes and I ended up writing a, uh, a short story that was all dialogue. And I thought, huh, this is a play. And I had acted as a kid, so I turned into a play, and I won a competition at Berkeley, the, American, the Irving American Wit and Humor Contest my senior year. So I guess that would be somebody saying, hey, your writing's pretty good. So my game plan when I graduated from Berkeley was to move to New York City, bartend, write plays, and die at 26. What a plan. That was as far into my future as I could figure out. Um, I went to Martha's Vineyard for the summer and worked there, met three playwrights from... Um, New York, can I swear on this yeah. podcast, who all said to me, fuck Manhattan. If you're not Sam Shepard, you can't get a play produced, go to LA. <laughs> so I went to LA because um, most of my college buddies are from here. And um, I had a reading of a play and somebody cornered me in the lobby and told me I should be writing movies. And at the time, I didn't know what a movie studio was. Mm. This would have been 1984. And then I met a guy and he had an idea for, for a screenplay. So we wrote it and... We almost sold it. We did not sell it, but people were interested, and that was it, the bug bit. And once the bug bit, the bug bit hard. And so then I wanted to be a writer. So then I started finding out what's a studio, what's a network, blah, blah, blah. I wanted to be a sitcom writer. Um, I worked for a production company. On the same day, I got into graduate school, got offered a job as a junior executive at a network, and was told by a producer one more script than I'd probably make it as a writer. So I made the least prudent choice I could and went to graduate school because I was tired of writing. I mean, tired of working and I wanted to, I thought, oh, student loans, I can pay those off and I'll just go to school and then sell something and that'll be it, to which my dad lost his mind. What did your dad do for a living? My dad was a doctor. Yeah, and literally, that makes sense. The minute I told him I was going to graduate school in playwriting, he literally said, I believe, what the fuck are you gonna do for a living? <laughs> um, uh, three years into a two and a three and a half years into a two year program, the, the dean sort of told me it was time for me to leave. So I got out, and a buddy and I had an idea for an action movie, and we worked on it for a year. 
And it was about a guy who put out oil well fires, and nobody knew what that meant. There was a guy named Red Adair out of Texas. We were sort of loosely basing on him. And three months before we finished the script, the first Iraq war broke out, and oil wells on fire were on TV every freaking night. We finished our script on a Thursday, and we sold it for half a million bucks on Friday. No, on Wednesday, excuse me. And we were off to the races, and that was it. So that's how I got started. So like, did I plan that? No, I thought I, you know, at best, I first thought I'd be a dead playwright. Then I thought I'd be a sitcom writer, and yet, and instead I ended up an action writer. And then my partner and I broke up, so I had to start over, and my agent now, because I had an agent, I was branded as an action writer, was pushed into being an action writer. So I did that, and I had to write a couple scripts before anything happened again. And then I had a career, and then I did, um, I don't know which one I did in what order, but I think I did Canine P.I., I think I did Femme de Kida, and then I did Exit Wounds, and then in 2007, we went on strike, we being the Writers Guild, and it became quickly evident that screenplays were done. If you were not either an independent screenwriter, you know, making not a lot of money outside the Guild, or a baby writer getting paid minimum, or you were a famous brand writer, you were just done, no one was gonna pay for you. So I quickly went into TV, so I segued into TV and I wrote six. Quick question. Yes. Those things that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. do you feel like they still hold true today? If you're not this, this, or this? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially in features for sure. And actually it's the same, that's what I'm seeing happening in TV now too. Yeah. Right, if you're a baby writer or an unknown writer in television now, they're paying you dirt in these mini rooms. And if you're a brand writer, they're paying you hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of million dollars and they've completely squeezed out the middle class writer. That's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. it's, this, it's history all over again. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so I just want to finish. So I went into um, TV, I wrote six pilots Came close, none of them got made. I was up for a bunch of jobs, but I had too many credits, which scared too many people. You know, like people look at my credits. Like I went into La Femme de Kida, and these guys had TV shows all up and down the resume, and they're like, you've written movies. Mm. And I, I couldn't impress them how much I wanted to be them. You know, I didn't yeah. want to, be, I wanted to be writing TV shows. But um, none got made, and I had too many credits, and I didn't get staffed, and then, I don't know, at some point Hollywood kind of zigged, I zagged. The last thing I did was a feature for Sony. Again, this is what happens. Um, I had about, you know, I would go through years in my career where I didn't work, and then I'd have boom years where I'd work, and I always chose to live beneath my means, so I could always write out the lean times, which sure. is what yeah. I recommend to anybody in this yes. business. So I never really sweat it too much. Um, so then, uh, after I'd written a bunch of, of these hour drama pilots and thrillers and action, whatever, I didn't sell anything for a couple of years. My manager kept saying, write a, you have to write another action movie. And a producer called me and said, I have a client and I want to do a romantic comedy. I'm like, I have one idea. And I, we went into Sony and we sold it in the room. So then I wrote this romantic comedy that they've never made. And I was supposed to get back uh, this month before the strike. So I'll get it back after the strike. And then we'll take it back out. It's actually a Mexican-American romantic comedy because okay. the guy is from Mexico. Um, and so now I don't know what I am. I mean, I think at this point, Going back to your original question, I just write whatever I want because I don't know what sells anymore. And I don't think anybody knows what sells. So I'm just going to write whatever strikes my fancy. You know, I have, um, at the moment, I have this romantic comedy I'm getting back. I just wrote an action-adventure romantic comedy. Um, I developed a, uh, a book, a children's uh, YA novel set in Poland at the end of World War II that's, I don't know, it's sort of, it's like a coming of age, like political thriller, which, I, but it's, it's fun and dark and has Nazis and, but it's a period piece, but I love that. And that's completely different. Um, we were talking earlier, I've got this um, crazy action adventure thing in Mexico. I, I've developed, I've got this dramedy in Sweden. So I kind of just going to, and then I'm going to go back to a play when I leave here. So how do you choose what to write then? Cause you, so you'll write anything. And you said, I'll just write what I want. How do you pick, hey, this idea is worth pursuing. Let me, let me work on this. What's your process if you have one? That's a great question. So my process goes like this. I, I spend a certain amount of time thinking, reading articles, listening to the radio, you know, online, watching, trying to figure out what's out there and like looking for things to spark my fancy. And then I'll make lists and I'll present them to my manager. And 98 to 99% of the time he says, don't write that. 
And these are like, you'll give them a log line or like, yeah, I'll be like, I've got an idea. I want to do something like this, you know, like, like, okay. like, like, like I'm still mad about this one. 10 years ago, I'm like Cleopatra. It, and he's oh, like, no. no, you can't do it. It's been done. And I'm like, now there's like some new show yeah. about Cleopatra. You know, yeah. I had a book that I'm like, I'll get the rights to this book. Um, and like this, um, this world war II um, YA thing, he's like, that'll never sell, <laughs> you know? So you never know. Like the, 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 the the romantic comedy he would not let me write he's like you're you're an action writer you cannot write this movie so i called him and just said um remember that thing he goes yeah i go well i'm pitching it next week with this hack he's like what <laughs> and then i called him and said hey i still he's like great you know so so if it gets made then i'll be a romantic comedy writer then i'll write those because you know you get branded by hollywood yeah so um what i look for though really what it boils down to is and i i've been watching a lot of tv and this relates is it's the characters you know um because I teach, and that's how I, you know, we met sort of yeah. through UCLA. Um, uh, a lot of my students today really want to write these sort of futuristic, dystopian, science fiction ideas. But when I watch them, I find that 90% of them are about the idea, not about the characters. And they love them, which is great, but I don't connect to those. I connect to characters. I mean, I just watched The Bear finally. So good. I loved it. My brother just watched both seasons and uh, he was I, so impressed. Yeah. I loved it because it's about their emotional drama and what they're struggling with in there, the human condition. Mm -hmm. And then I watched Silo. And I know a lot of people like Silo, but I could not have cared less if I tried. And, and then isn't the goal, like the highest form of this stuff, like to pair the high concept idea with the characters that you cannot stop caring about. Oh, absolutely. That's the like holy grail, right? It's like if you can do the concept thing that gets, you know, everybody in concepts interested and the people who are all characters and like relationships focused, when you can marry those two things, yeah, then you've got, you know. There's also this like we're talking about scripts and we're talking about novels and we're talking about plays. And I think John Irving once said that novels are about a person, plays are about two people or people and scripts are about the audience so mm. i think the trifecta of what you're saying angel is you have the high concept and you have the character but you also have like what is the audience appeal to both of those things combined together right i'm, I'm sorry who's john irving garp the world according to garp <laughs> yeah no <laughs> he's was, being facetious uh, oh yeah no that that and yeah that's so that sounds like can, can you repeat that say that again novels so are about novels are about a person plays are about People are two people. Yeah, people. And scripts are about um, an audience. That makes, yeah. You know, I mean, they always say films come at you, mm -hmm. right? When you watch a film, a film comes at you. You're in the dark theater. It's larger than life. It comes to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about TV anymore because everybody seems to watch TV with a second screen. You know? Yeah. Yeah. TV's kind of become a very weird entity. Yeah. It's almost as if the audience doesn't care, if that makes any sense. Except when we have shows like The Bear, I could not stop watching, you know the episode I'm talking about. Oh, the, yeah. The dinner. Season, episode six, season two. On the edge of my seat, like high drama. Couldn't take my eyes off the screen. Without giving away any spoilers, if you haven't seen the show. I haven't seen it okay, yet. Okay, so. so the first season of The Bear is about the restaurant sure. and the guy who inherits it from his brother who killed himself mm -hmm. and everyone knew the brother and everyone's affected by this trauma. Mm -hmm. And while they're trying to keep the restaurant afloat, they're going through their own emotional trauma. So there's a profound amount of stress and emotion and everyone is yelling at everyone all the time. And it's kind of uncomfortable. It's compelling, but it's yeah. kind of uncomfortable. Then in season two, they slow down the show and they actually invested in every character and just when the rhythm of the show gets really steady, they do one episode where it's the whole family and you see all the chaos again. And now it, in a weird emotional way, explains all of the drama and the trauma of season one. So it's doubly freighted. It's brilliant. It's really brilliant. It's beautiful. So we had Liz Hanna on the show and she was talking about um, one of the greatest pitches that she heard was like f just four pages long like the pitch deck was four pages long do you remember yeah. it was for something she was producing uh, but not yeah. writing and the writer for it came up with the pitch that was she said it was all character driven and that they pitched it in a way that she had never seen a pitch done before but from then on out she would always do her pitches that way which so, was we tried to get specifics 
She was a little vague, but all she said was it was it was just based on the character, like we've been talking about. And my, since the name of our show is Pitch Podcast, my question to you is what goes into a good pitch? There are so many different elements. Like somebody pitched the bear in a room and they're like, it's this character dealing with this trauma. First of all, if I knew what was a great pitch, I'd be a lot wealthier. <laughs> uh, let me just start by saying that. I very can subjective. I can only tell you how I pitch. Um, and I've, I've had a fair amount of luck. I mean, I've, I've, I've sold six or seven pilots on pitches and movies pitching. I always pitch from the character. John Rogers, who uh, is um, wrote Catwoman and ran the librarian um, and um, Leverage, when we were pitching a show together, he said, just explain the main character and then just tell them the story of the pilot, which is about the main character. And you fill in the details as needed, but that's really it. We, um, we pitched the show last year that we ended up specking and we're going to still try to sell after the strike, but it was, um, it was basically a Latino Serpico set in East LA and in the sheriff station. Cool. And we pitched it completely from the point of view of the main character. You know, TV, great TV shows are about a character and who, and somebody or someone with whom the audience identifies. Mm. And that is why they want to go into that world. Even if it's a show like Silo or a show like The Last of Us or it's Ted Lasso or it's even Squid Game. I mean, Squid Game's about that guy, even though it's a super high concept show. Yep. Right? We yep. follow that guy. And um, that's how I, now, when I used to go into rooms and pitch, there'd probably be a lot more banter. We might get into a little bit more of the world, you know, because I had time and we were talking to each other and looking people in the eye and you could read their gestures. But now that we do it on Zoom, most of my pitches run 12 to 15 minutes tops and we immediately start up. But we just, what I do is I give the concept because they are looking for what's the story engine of the show and what is the concept, the arena and, mm -hmm. you know, the tone in one sense. So they get who the audience is. And then I just start with the main character and I literally explain the other characters in their relationship to that main character. And that's it. And I give them what I try to do in a pitch is give them enough of the pilot so they get what the story is. And then I lay out seasons one, two, and three. I mean, my shows all go somewhere. Mm -hmm. I had, um, years ago, I had a meeting with a guy and he had read a pilot script I wrote and he asked me after, he goes, I love the script. He goes, but where does the show go? And I said, well, season one, it goes here. Season two, it goes here. Season three, it goes here. And by the end of season five, here's where this main character ends up. And he turned to his development executive and said, we're not taking any more meetings with baby writers. Because evidently he had these two pitch meetings that morning where people had written pilots he had read. And he said, where's the show going? And they said, I don't know. Oh, no. Yeah, so I'm right now, um, I'm teaching a class at UCLA on it's the first of two quarters on writing pilots. So this quarter, they have to outline their pilot and then next quarter they will write it. And what I found in the other writing classes for pilots in, at UCLA, nobody talks about building the world. Like I've had other students from other classes come in and they've got a pilot and they literally don't know what episode two is, let alone how the season ends. So what I'm making these students do is build the world and know three seasons of their show. They don't have to have every detail worked out, but you have to know the journey your character is going on beyond season one or you can't write your show. Absolutely. One of my favorite shows is Supernatural, Eric um, Kripke, right? Okay. And in... Season six, there's something that pays off that they planted as something small in season one that they knew. I was like, you know from watching a show like that, that during the whole course of it, you were in the hands of a master craftsperson. Right. And I think that's so necessary, like what you're doing, building world. I've spent the past two years researching the mafia just to build the world of my TV series. Angel and I's conversations constantly are all about world and character. Um, no, I was going to say, I agree. You just, you have, if you don't know the world of your show, you don't know the story you're telling. You have to know who the people are who live in that world, but you have to know the world that they're, that they're dealing with. Um, I had a kid in my class last quarter and he wrote um, a sci-fi thing, I think set 200 years in the future. It's a brilliant idea. I mean, I love this idea, but the kid got lost 
in explaining everything. Mm. Mm-hmm. And the only example I could give, and I'm not like a real sci-fi guy, I'm not a Star Wars guy, but Andor was great because they didn't explain anything. I didn't understand any of like the logistics of the world. It didn't matter. I was focused on the characters and what they were struggling with because that's where the human emotion is and that's you know what we connect to. I think that's so true. So as a journalist, we're taught not to put the jargon in because nobody understands. Like military, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? And it dates you. It dates your piece. Yes. Um, I have a quick question about the class. So for our audience who they're interested in writing a TV pilot, can they still take your class? Or are you offering it again in the spring? Like how does that work and where do you? Um, I'm a cog in a big wheel. So my answer, my honest answer is I don't really know. Yeah. Um, I teach at UCLA Extension, and the classes are offered quarterly. It's the TV writing program that I'm in at the moment is a four-quarter program where you write. First, you outline and learn sort of the basics of writing and write a spec script in quarter two, which is where you I, we met when you came to speak. Mm-hmm. And then in quarter three, you outline the world for your pilot. In quarter four, you write your hour pilot. I teach hour writing, your hour pilot. And then I believe you can even take a, I think I'm teaching a class for people who want to rewrite their pilot next quarter. And there's a whole bunch. I don't know what the curriculum offers, but that's the basic structure. If people want to take it, just go to Google UCLA Extension because I don't even know what the website is. <laughs> yeah. What um, what are the realities uh, that, you talk about with your students about new writers having a spectacular spec sample and maybe a world fleshed out, maybe even a great pitch, possibly selling something. I tell them to make sure that they know how to make coffee <laughs> because they're going to be working at Starbucks. I, I mean, and I, and I, I say that facetiously, but we're in a moment right now Right now, given that we're on strike, let's so when the strike ends, there's going to be a huge contraction in this business. I don't know if anybody heard, you guys heard Bob Iger talking the other day, and he said Disney is thinking about possibly selling ABC and FX. I didn't hear that, no. Oh, yeah. And uh, Donna Langley is now in, at Uni- Universal, NBC Universal is now in charge of both TV and film, though they've never combined those two divisions. So, what you know, that immediately means you need half as many executives. And they're all the networks and all the streamers have already said they're cutting way back on production next year. Mm. And they're also going to buy more global stuff because it's a lot cheaper. And the reality is, is that that there is a glut of scripts. There has been for decades. And, you know, when when um, I ask my students, I go, who do you think is your competition? They all look around at each other. And I'm like, uh, uh-uh, your competition is me because I'm writing, too. And I'm trying to spell a spec script. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah. So it's not that you should not be hopeful, but the reality of selling a spec script today in mm-hmm. TV has shrunk prodigiously from what it was five years ago. But that's still your calling card. So if you have a great script, you know, all the things that you said go into a great script. If you have a great script, you probably won't sell it right now, but that will be the thing that gets you work. Yeah, you can get staffed from that. Or you can get other like assignments from something like that, theoretically. Theor- Gosh, I wish I could say that. But no, like, what's the hesitation? Tell well, me. Yeah, well, the hesitation. Please, is, no, the hesitation is that the way the business is going with the mini rooms and the lack of staffing, I don't know how you get a job anymore. I'm not know. kidding. When I, I hate to be so dire and dark, what I what I tell my students, literally, what I tell my students right now is, go pick it. The Writers Guild is on strike. Go out, carry a sign. You know, don't be pushy, but make friends. You'll meet people. You'll meet famous writers. You'll meet people you respect. It's a way, that's a way to develop a relationship that can give you the opportunity to get in later. I, most of my students that are writers, I have several that are writers now, they all start as assistants. And that's it. It's, it's really become a business about who knows you, mm. not who you know. Yeah. And so that's what I tell my students. I say, yeah, write, know your craft, have a great sample, and then do anything you can to get in you know, to the business, be a PA, Mm -hmm. be an assistant, volunteer your time. If you want to be a feature writer, go volunteer on a, on a low budget set. Everybody loves free labor. You'll meet people and that's how you get started. So that's what I tell them. You know, you got to have your, you know, your I's dot and your T's crossed, but you Mm -hmm. really, you got to find your way into the business. And that's the hardest part as it's contracting. It's so important. Networking is so key to having a successful career because if you're a writer, you need to look for a producer who's going to champion your script like Quentin Tarantino found, what's his name for Reservoir Dogs, right? 
or you need to find a director who's Lawrence going to, Bender. Thank you. Who's going to connect you to getting your stuff made? The managers are the ones who usually find young writers. Like yeah. anybody who writes a great script in my class, I will happily forward to my manager because I want my students to succeed and I want my manager to keep making money and I want him to keep liking me. Yeah. So if he doesn't like my script, maybe I can make him some money that way. Yeah. But but you know, but like the, the truth of the matter is that I mean you guys know everyone in Hollywood who has a career got lucky. We had to have our skill set, mm-hmm. but we all we all got a lucky break. Mm-hmm. Right? The lucky break gets you into the door and then you your talent and your drive is what keeps you there. Yeah. You know, I, I it's funny, this is an aside, but I just read an article about Ben Platt, there was some complaint the other day that he refused to answer a question about being a Nepo baby because he's the son of Mark Platt. And, you know, this Nepo baby thing is dumb. It's just it's just whiny and stupid and petulant because the reality is is that, okay, he got a break because of who he is, but he's not Ben Platt because of who his father is. He's Ben Platt because he's a talented guy who works really, really hard. Yeah. And that's true of every quote-unquote Nepo baby. I mean, isn't that what um, the mom, and the bear? Oh, um... We're giving away a spoiler here. Curtis. Uh, Jamie, Lee uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Curtis. You know, she just said, yeah, I'm a Nepo baby. Yeah. You know, but she's Nepo baby who worked her butt off. That's why she's Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, yeah. and that's the thing. So I don't begrudge anybody anything. You get in how you get in, however that is, yeah. you know, and then because you stay because of your your talent. And actually, what I tell my students is, to back to your question, Angel, is it's drive. There's somebody out there who wants it more than you. There's somebody out there working 14 hours a day and you've got to be that person. If you're a dilettante, if you think it's going to be fun, it can be really fun. I mean, it's a, if you can make a career of it, I've been really blessed, but it's your drive. Absolutely. Your drive is what separates you Absolutely. You have else. to hit the grind. That's why I had a mentor, Bill Moshi, who's a journalist. He goes, what differentiates me from a more talented person is I put the time in more. Same here. That's, that's I, I'm hands down. I'm an average writer. I'm just determined to keep doing it. And um, that's actually why I became a writer. So when I first moved to LA, I was like noodling around being a writer. And through a weird set of circumstances, I ended up reading for the lead in ABC pilot. And, and uh, <laughs> What you know, pilot was it? Did it make it to air? It, no, it never made it. Yeah, it was oh, the okay. Flamingo Kid. They were trying to turn it into a TV kid. show. Okay. And the casting director at ABC was like, you're really good. You're too old for this role, but you're really good. You should do this. And I went home and thought about it for 48 hours and realized I couldn't live in a world where I was told I was too tall, I was too short, I was too fat, I was too thin, I was too this, I was too that, and I couldn't do anything about it. But as a writer, every time I got put in a corner, I could write my way out of it. And that's the thing. I mean, as you know, we were saying, I wanted to be a sitcom writer, then I was an action writer, then I ended up writing TV pilots. Now I'm writing a romantic comedy. I'm writing a two-person play I'm writing a one-person you know I can write myself into where I want to go because I understand structure and story and how to put that all together and so you know whether you're getting paid or not as a writer when you're writing you're writing and that's the thing when you're an actor or director you need an audience you need money you got you need Mm -hmm. film you need a crew you don't need anything when you're a writer yeah well, this brings me to my question. I wanted to ask you your opinion, and I'm just going to love whatever your opinion is, on reps telling writers that it's easier for them to pitch them if they write one genre. Like, I can't pitch you if you write all of the genres. You're telling me that you write romantic comedies and action and and novels and et cetera. How am I supposed to pitch you? Yeah, so you do anything and everything, whatever you want. What do you tell your students, and what is your thought on that? Well, that conversation... It was was the first 10 years of my professional career (laughs) because I wanted to write all these other things. Yeah. And my agent at the time said, no, you're an action writer. You have to write more action. And if you think that's bad advice, my first agent who found me in film school was Jeff Robinoff, who was the former president of Warner Brothers. So he knew a thing or two about how the business worked. One of the smartest guys I ever worked with. So the problem is that the business pigeonholes you. And so you have to pick something. You have to pick a lane because if you do everything, no one knows what your brand is. You're writing, your, your, your scripts are your brand. And if your brand is unfocused, nobody just knows what to hire you for. So what I tell students is write what you love and pick the genre you want to be. And if you want to write comedy, write comedy. If you want to write hour, write hour. If you want to write half hour, what single cam, write that. But pick one, be conscious. I did not want to be an action writer. And I, you know, I was not that 
forward thinking at the time. And so it was a struggle for the first couple of years. So I had to really kind of lean in because for me, most action movies were bad. I mean, the first script we sold, we wanted Mel Gibson to be in it because this is back in the day when he had just done Thunderdome and he was, Mel Gibson was the guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we found out Clint Eastwood wanted to make the movie and our career was made. I mean, I had 40 meetings set up and then the studio gave it to Steven Seagal mm-hmm. and we had to go rent a Steven Seagal movie because I'd never seen it. He had already made four movies. I'd never seen any of his movies because I didn't want to see them. I wasn't interested. They weren't interesting because they were uh, just silly action movies like Jean-Claude Van Damme and because they didn't have character. The character got whittled out. And so, and that's, <laughs> I mean, if you go see On Deadly Ground, I will just say this. I took my sister to the premiere and halfway through it, I turned to her and said, Debbie, I wrote this and I cannot follow it. Hmm. <laughs> so not a lot of what we wrote was left in the movie. But we got sole credit because nothing substantial was changed by any one person, right? Wow. I, I There's so many like questions I have about, <laughs> not for myself, but for like my mom who's listening or someone who's not in the mm-hmm. industry. Yeah who goes, wait, wait, if you're the writer and you went to go see the movie, why was it so different from what you wrote? What is like a basic explanation for someone who doesn't understand the process between what you wrote and then what ends up on screen? Why things change so much? What's your mother's name? My mother's name is Jan. Jan? Jan, yeah. So Jan. If you want to find out what Ed has to say to Angel's mom about why scripts change so much from page to screen, Tune in next week to the following episode of Pitch. Thanks for listening. If you're on the fence about subscribing, know that a portion of all subscription fees go toward the nonprofit Young Storytellers, raising voices one story at a time. We here at Pitch support and stand in solidarity with the members of the WGA and everyone supporting their current fight for fair compensation and their rightful place in the future of film, television, and streaming content production. Head over to WGA.org to find out more and how you can support as well.